This episode of Monsters Among Us is brought to you by Cryptic Crate. Welcome to Monsters Among Us. I'm your guide, Derek Hayes. Thank you guys for coming back for another episode. I'm going to be up front with each of you and say that today I just don't feel well. But uh, we're going to try to plow through this and and, uh, put out a great episode despite. And you know, as they say, the show must go on. So, without further hesitation, let's go on with the show. Our first call of the evening... That's right, we're going to jump right into it. Our first call of the evening is from Bunny in Texas. Hi, my name is Bunny and I'm from Texas. And I was calling because I am a new listener. I'm going through the um, seasons right now. I'm on season two, episode 11. And uh, I heard a story about a a woman hearing someone calling her name or um, calling her friend's name. Um, She said she'd never heard anything like that. Um, down here in Texas, amongst me and my cousins, um, it was actually quite common for us to hear family members calling our names, even though there was no one there. Uh, I remember, vividly remember, being at my grandmother's house and hearing my dad or my mom calling me to come outside, uh, look out the window, and there would be nobody there. And, um, same thing happened to my sisters. We would go into Mexico and we would be in the house and, you know, I would see my sister kind of running out already past nine o'clock, you know, kind of like, hey, where are you going? She's like, well, mom's calling me. Like, hey, mom's in the kitchen. She's not outside. So, um, brought this up a few times to my grandmother. Um, just, you know, it was the middle of the night and I'm staying with her. I'm telling her, hey, I think my mom's outside calling me. And she's just like, no. Um, she's like don't ever reply to it and don't ever yell back to it um she just said that there were spirits mocking uh people we knew to try to draw us out or try to draw it or try to get it to come in so you know it was very um well known amongst our families that if it, it is a noise outside you do not respond to it you do not invite it in you do not walk up by to it. And I, I got in trouble all the time. Um, I still catch myself doing this where I hear something or I, I would I would think I saw something. Uh, for me, it's just I get drawn to going to the window or opening the door or walking outside, uh, which isn't very safe, but that's my immediate, my immediate reaction. So um, this is just something that was told to me, something that was just general information amongst uh, family members, when we went out of town to visit other family in the valley or, or in Mexico, um, you know, we kind of would tell these stories and they're like, oh yeah, that's, you know, what they would tell us too. Um, don't know if it's, you know, um, just something within our family or if it's well known outside of that, but that's, you know, what they told us was not to respond to it, that it was not something good and it was trying to draw us out or trying to get us to invite it in. So thank you. Love the show. And um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Bunny, for taking the time to submit that call. Now, it's it's strange. I don't really know the source of uh, this phenomenon, but I have heard of it before. Uh, I don't know if it's ghostly or if it's um, somehow uh, related to like the doppelganger effect. It's really curious, to be honest with you. I don't know even how to label this. But I will tell you one thing. It certainly reminds me of... 
the Puckwudgie legends from the Bridgewater Triangle back in uh, Massachusetts. For several hundred years, there have been legends of the infamous Puckwudgie, which is a small troll-like creature that was a part of a Native American legend that later was adopted by some of the settlers in that area. But they're often known to beckon people into the woods, into the dangers of the swamp, uh, by calling their names. So uh, it's definitely something that sounds quite similar to that, but I'm not real sure, as I said, what that phenomenon is. So, uh, you know, as these calls continue to come in, I'll do some more research and see if we can't, you know, try to lock down a, a logical um, category, I suppose, to put these into, because it's, it's something that, uh, although it seems like there seems to be legends in place, uh, it isn't talked about that much. So uh, very interesting stuff. Thank you again, Bunny, for taking the time to call. Our next call of the night takes us to a creepy graveyard. The following is Rhonda's call from the state of New York. Hi, Derek. Um, I am a new listener. Um, I discovered your podcast, which is amazing, by the way. I discovered it a few weeks ago when I had gotten caught up on all my other paranormal podcasts and decided to give it a whirl and was very pleasantly surprised and pleased. Um, I guess I should start off by telling you that from a very young age, I was raised in the pagan faith that um, I was taught to do spell work. And I guess, as my friends like to say, you can go ahead and just call me a witch. There was a time um, when I was about five or six years old that my brother, who is nine years older than me, he loved to, uh, as older brothers do, beat up on his younger siblings and, you know, things of that nature. And he thought that it would be a really great idea to play hide and go seek in the biggest cemetery in the town where we lived in the western part of New York, which is right outside of Corning in a very, very, very small town called Avoca, New York. And all of our parents, it was, well, let me backtrack. We had all of our cousins. We were all very close growing up. So we all ranged in age from, I don't know, five, six years old, all the way up to, you know, mid-teens. And so we were all up there um, playing hide and go seek in the cemetery and all of our parents aunts uncles whatever were all at my cousin's house just up the street playing cards it had to have been sometime in the summer maybe yeah I would say summer only because it was very mild out it was very nice out and it was encroaching on dusk um I was a very small child and I was running around trying to find a good place to hide. My brother was it, so we, um, you know, he was the one that would come around and and catch us and I was looking for a place to hide. Well, I found a headstone to hide behind and I looked up and there was, oh, I suppose I should probably tell you at this point too that excuse me, that from the age of three, I have been able, that was the first time I remember um, seeing them anyway, I have been able to see spirits, hear them, interact with them, smell them, smell scents, I suppose, that would um, be correlated to them in their, when they were incarnation. So I have been able to have that gift, I suppose you could say, since I was probably born, but I was three years old the first time I remember ever um, seeing it. And it was my dad who I saw originally who had passed away the year before. Anyway, back to the cemetery and I'm hiding and I'm in this little tiny ball and I, um, I remember looking up and there was a man standing there. Um, he was very kind of stern face. However, you could tell that he may have been a grandfather or something of the kind because he had a little bit of a 
playfulness around his mouth. Um, and I remember him being in a suit and I remember the jacket being buttoned and he was beckoning to me like, you know, come, come here, you know, with his first two fingers, like, come, you know, come here. And, um, I realized that I could sort of see through him. Um, and it frightened me, but I was also intrigued. And I looked away and I looked back and he was gone. So I thought, okay, it was my imagination. And I could hear my brother coming close. So I crept another couple rows over in the cemetery and was um, hiding behind yet another headstone. The second headstone that I was hiding behind in the cemetery was a like a mon like a monumental thing. It was it was like an um, obelisk, like a tall one. And um, so I was standing up instead of crouching. And I remember him being very very close to me. And that's when it began to scare me. Um, he was walking towards a mausoleum, one of the mausoleums in the cemetery, and he was beckoning me to follow him and I could hear him very clearly I need your help come help me I need your help and this is the first time I remember ever having a spirit come and actually ask me for my help but again only being five or six years old it scared the crap out of me I started screaming I don't mind telling you that I wet myself um, <clears throat> my sisters and my female cousins all came running over and my brother said, oh, she's just, she wants to get out of, you know, playing, you know, that kind of thing as older brothers are wont to do. And my sister said, no, I really think that there's something wrong. Something scared her. I was scared so badly that I was in a catatonic state for at least 24 hours, I believe it was. And my aunt wanted to rush me to the hospital immediately because she thought that there was something physically wrong with me. And then my cousins all started telling her, that um, I just started screaming and that um, I had been pointing and saying, what about the man? And that's all. I don't remember saying it. Um, I, They remember me saying it. That's all I could get out before I completely went, completely went catatonic. I woke up a day or so later and my other aunt and my mother were sitting in our Eden kitchen and I came out and I had been in my bedroom and I came out and long story short the man who had been in spirit beckoning to me asking me for his help for my help his mausoleum had been broken into and it was severely damaged um I couldn't I like I said I guess it was probably around 1976 maybe ish um, and I don't, I don't remember what the man's name was. I don't remember any of that. And I just remember saying to my mother, that's the man that I saw. And she said that that was an impossibility because he had passed away and that, you know, well, we know we don't get, we, we don't get to see people after they passed away. And that's pretty much when, um, she discovered that I could see spirits. Uh, that was not the first, as I said, nor was it going to be the last. And um, my friends all think it's pretty cool, but not so much sometimes. Um, they can get pretty scary. Um, I guess that's about it for that. There are plenty more where that came from. But, uh, yeah, I, I was very, very scared. And then, alternately, as I got older, I remember just feeling really, really bad for him because, you know, he, you know, their, their resting place had been desecrated and that was really sad to me. So, um, yeah, that's it. Uh, keep up the good work. The podcast is awesome and I'm sure I'll call back in. I may even do it in a few minutes. So catch you later. Thanks, Derek. Bye. Thank you, Rhonda. Now, your call reminded me of my childhood, actually. Uh, in the back corner of my grandparents' farm was a small cemetery called Crooked Creek. Uh, it's actually a 
pretty creepy name for a tiny little uh, swatch of land cut out of the woods. It was just filled with ancient gravestones. Uh, some of the people buried there were Revolutionary War soldiers and, and um, pioneers into the Ohio area. But, you know, as kids, we just thought it was a great place to play. Uh, they mowed it maybe once a year, so the grass was about ankle deep. It was just a fun place to explore and look around. There was a creepy old tree right in the center of it. I'm going to post some pictures in the show notes to kind of share this strange little location. Uh, but that certainly reminded me of fond memories of playing around that little graveyard. Uh, but as far as the story is concerned, your reaction is, is very expected. If if I were young and saw a, what was obviously a ghost in a graveyard, I probably would have wet my pants as well. So uh, there's definitely no shame in that. Uh, but the thing I, I did want to point out here was that I, I believe you can go to your local library and research their old newspaper files. Uh, most, most libraries have access to either microfiche or something like that that you can go back and look for articles. And I say that because perhaps you can go back and find an article about that particular mausoleum being vandalized. And that may give you a name, which could also give you a photograph, which could in turn uh, help validate your sighting. You know, if you describe the man looking this way and you find a picture of him matching that mausoleum and the description's the same, I mean, that's a, that's a pretty surefire way to validate a claim. Uh, so that's something you may want to look into a bit there, Rhonda. But uh, either way, thank you so much for the call. I truly appreciate it. And we're going to move on to Cass's call from my home state of Ohio. Hi, um, my name is Cass. I'm from uh, rural Cincinnati, Ohio, um, just outside of Bethel. Um, Now, my family, they come from the Kentucky Appalachian Mountains, and... Of course, we're very superstitious people, just to put that into perspective. Um, But I now live in an apartment um, with my father, my sister, and our two pets. And um, this happens in about, I'd like to say, 2013 to 2014, something somewhere around there. It was about around this time of year. I used to go out at 5 in the morning and take my dog out before I had to go to school. And there was there's this tree line that's by the dog park right down the street from my apartment. And um, I was, you know, just looking around. It's cold. It's dark out. The sun hasn't even come up yet, but there's a street lamp that's lighting up the whole field of the dog park. And right behind the fence, all the way in the very back of it, there's um, this thing that I think is a stump at first. And I notice my dog stops and he's staring at it too. And he looks back at me and then looks back at the stump thing. And when I look over at it again, it's now this gray humanoid looking thing. Um, I was kind of far, about probably 25 yards away from it. And I mean, it was gray. I could see it's I could see its bones. It was real skinny. And um, it was standing. And I could obviously, like, see its arms. I could see, like, the arm muscles. And his... It, it was short, but it was probably about as tall as I am. And I'm 5'5", five, 5'6", five, five, about there. And I don't know. My, uh, my sister has seen something similar to it. So has my dad around here. And... Um, we also live right by a graveyard, and I've heard stories of things like that being seen around graveyards or under porches and things um, around here and around um, Illinois, Kentucky. So uh, that's my story. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you, Cass, for the call. Now, the description of this creature that you witnessed falls in line with several others that uh, previously exist. And of course I'm talking about uh, the rake, or the wraith, which I believe, in my personal opinion here anyway, that it was something, that that was something that was created specifically for creepypasta or something along those lines. I don't know that there's a long historical uh, record of of rake sightings. Uh, I may be wrong here, but this is a fairly new phenomenon to me, and it's my understanding that that's where it came from. 
But there is a creature that this does resemble that does have a much lengthier historical uh, footprint. And of course I'm talking about the Wendigo. The Wendigo is described as uh, ashened or gray-skinned, lanky, skinny, emaciated. You know, it's just, just a, a frail, I guess for lack of a better term, disgusting looking little being. And I'm not going to say that Ohio is the hotbed for Wendigo historical sightings, but the northern states certainly are. I know that New York, Minnesota, Michigan, you know, a lot of the northern states have Wendigo legends, and certainly southern parts of Canada. So, uh, but, you know, perhaps there's something strange going on in Cincinnati. It's not out of the realm of possibilities. Now, I will say there is an interesting correlation to something that I heard while I was in uh, Kentucky for Crypticon, which wasn't too far from Cincinnati, actually. It was uh, held in Frankfurt. During my town hall talk, uh, one of the volunteers that told a story told about uh, seeing a gray entity in the woods. I- I'm trying to remember. I want to say he was in Indiana. I'm going to have to go back and check on that. But if you go back and watch my town hall meeting that uh, we posted on Facebook, you can actually hear that story, and I believe he called it in, so I, I just haven't got around to filing that call yet, but uh, I believe that call is called in. So we'll circle back on this when that call does finally uh, reach the air. But I believe what he saw was more along the lines of, um, I want to say static, like a static entity, which we've also reported on the show. But uh, I don't know. It's strange stuff, and it's definitely something that would be creepy to run into anywhere, you know, let alone, you know, in the woods. So thank you again, Cass, for taking the time to share that call. Now our next story comes to us from an anonymous source from Parts Unknown. Hi, I have just recently started listening to your podcast and um, obviously am fairly behind. So I'm starting from the beginning and reading or listening rather binge listening, I should say, um, all the way through. And just recently listened to the episode, I think it might have been the last episode of season one, actually, that's how far behind I am, um, with the um, lady from Hawaii who felt like she'd always been sensitive to some superstition, supernatural type thing, and um, that kind of resonated with me um, because I've always felt sensitive to, uh, I don't know what to call it, but something as well. When I was younger, um, I'm in my 20s now, but when I was like five or six, I used to have dreams all the time. And uh, then the next day or two days afterwards, the things that happened in my dream would happen. Uh, one vivid memory I have that's very silly but always stuck out in my mind was I had a dream that the toilet overflowed in our house which wasn't that big of a deal that happens a lot except that we had lived in this house four or five years and never had that ever happened and then the next day the toilet overflowed and I would have a lot of deja vu moments and couldn't figure out why until I realized that I had dreamt about it the night before um, and would predict the next day so in that vein I kind of had a few things happen to me that I felt were all connected um, The first and foremost was when I was 13, um, I had three of my family members pass away within um, a few months of each other. They say things happen in three. And one was a great grandmother who I wasn't particularly close with, but I'd spent some time with. One was another great grandmother who I wasn't really close with very much at all. And then one was my Nana, which is my uh, mother's mom, who was practically a second mom to me. I spent every weekend at her house. Um, So when the first two passed away, Um, I had dreams that they were just sitting, um, you know, in the chair in my house and were basically just calming me and letting me know it was okay. Um, And I know that could just be a dream in my subconscious, uh, me trying to make myself feel better about it, but at 13 that seemed a little bit odd. Um, Then when my Nana passed away, um, she was the closest one to me, Um, she always used to have to be on an oxygen machine. Um, and so I had a dream that I was sitting in her house in her chair that she always sat in. And she walked to the oxygen machine and turned it off and looked at me and smiled. She didn't say anything. She just looked at me and smiled. And I felt this extreme sense of peace. And then that was it. 
um, until that dream, that was about a week after she had passed, I kept walking around corners and thinking I'd see her. Um, and then once I had that dream, I never saw her again. Um, again, that could have just been my subconscious trying to help me deal with the loss of somebody I really cared about. But given my history of dreams before, it felt like a little bit more. Um, then a few years later, um, I have moved into two separate houses that have had um I guess some less than happy events happened to them. Um, when I was still living with my parents, I moved into a house where, unfortunately, in the driveway, um, the husband shot his wife and then shot himself. Um, that was in the 70s. Um, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I know that that did happen. And then shortly after that, a couple who at the time was not older but had gotten much older, of course, in recent years, purchased the house and lived there for a long time. So every time I went into the driveway for the first few months, I always felt sort of uneasy. And when we first moved in, that old couple had left this pink chair, and it was super ugly. But we left it because at the time, my parents had never owned a house before, and so we didn't have much furniture. Um, and for a while, there was nothing wrong. The chair was fine. I mean, it was comfortable. It just was very, very ugly. Um, about six months later, um, I just got this uneasy feeling every time I sat in the chair. And there would be times where I would walk into the room that it was in at night, and I would swear that I saw an old lady sitting in it. Um, I don't know why. I don't know like why that came to me, but it just did, and I just got really uneasy about it. So I begged my father, and he put it out in the shed, and I never felt weird again. Um, then shortly after that, um, I don't know, I can't remember, I think my parents were reading the obituaries, or um, maybe had heard it from the realtor that they, the lady had had, who had been moved into like assisted living had actually passed away. Um, and she passed away at roughly the same time that I started seeing her in the chair. And I had never seen her. I was pretty, I mean, I was young enough. I was 11 or 12 when my parents bought the house. So I was young enough that I wasn't involved in the proceedings. I never saw the lady. I didn't know what she looked like, but I saw her distinctly in that chair. The second thing that happened um, was kind of a continuation over the last two years. Um, I just recently purchased my own house. Um, super nice, cute neighborhood. It had been completely redone. Um, somebody had bought it and flipped it and redone it. And we got getting a lot of mail from the for the person who used to live here, so I assumed he had probably passed away, and that's like we kept getting mail because it just never seemed to stop. Um, so I looked up one time, you know, because I was getting mail to his full name, so I looked up one time to see where he was, you know, if he had moved on, what he had done, because, like I said, we had purchased it from somebody who had bought it from him, or actually it turned out to be the family. Um, and so we were curious, I was curious about what had happened and so I looked it up and he said that he did have an obituary he had passed away but it was very bland so I wasn't sure if he had passed away in his bed or what had happened and um, so it turns out my neighbor across the street is super nosy and um, loves to tell stories so she actually let me know that he unfortunately shot himself um, in the house in one of the bedrooms but never let me know which one um, so I of course being sensitive to things, I had always kind of felt like there was something uneasy in the house, but I couldn't figure out what. Um, so I assumed it was just me knowing that she had um, told me this. I assumed that that was just my mind's way of letting me know that I was a little bit uncomfortable, but no big deal. Um, we started redoing the house, and as it turns out, the gentleman who lived here and shot himself, his name was Steve. Steve was a smoker. Um, and he smoked in the house like crazy. But of course, they had redone the whole house, so everything smelled fine. Well, when we went into the bedroom, um, one of the bedrooms, and that was a room that we had been using as like a entertainment room, and we began replacing the carpet in there. So we ripped out the carpet, and all of a sudden, there was just the smell of cigarette smoke everywhere. And it was really odd because my grandparents were both smokers. I knew what the smell of like, you know, years old cigarette smoke smelled like. This smelled fresh. This smelled like somebody was smoking a cigarette in that room. Um, and it just was, I mean, overwhelming. And it was, 
I all of a sudden felt intensely just dread and uneasy, and I just didn't feel right in that room, and I was shaky and clammy. So, you know, I, I put that on pause. I waited and had my husband come back in there with me, and we finished up the remodel. Um, and a couple of days later, I was talking to my neighbor again, and I had to ask him, like, you know which room he was shot in, uh, or he shot himself in, and it was actually the room that we had just redone. Um, so I don't know if he was making his presence known. I don't know if somehow the smoke just got stuck in the floor. Um, we have a slab, so it would have had to have been stuck in the concrete, which seems weird. But I don't know what happened. But I just have never felt more like there was a presence. And not necessarily an unhappy presence, just a presence. Kind of like it just wanted me to know that it was there. Um, so since then, I after we redid that room, I haven't felt his presence anymore. And I know this is crazy, but I can usually walk into a building and I can kind of feel, I don't want to say a ghost, I'm kind of a self-admitted skeptic. So I don't want to say it's a ghost, but I can feel that there's some sort of presence in the building or room. And then typically when I feel that way, it turns out that there is, has been a um, death involved with that place. So anyway, that's my story. Um, just kind of a weird thing that has happened to me. And uh, I've loved listening to your podcast. So I look forward to listening to it a lot more. And uh, thanks for your time. Thank you, caller, for sharing that story. Now, before I get into the analysis of the call, I want to tell a brief story that happened to me just the other day that kind of falls in line with some of what uh, the caller discussed. Uh, as I've mentioned in the past, we have an inflatable hot tub that we bought off of Amazon. Uh, highly recommend it, by the way. They're only like 300 bucks, and they're, they're very um, uh, well-built. Let's put it that way. It's lasted several years. But anyway, as we were on our way out there, a time, a time of day popped into my head, and it was almost as if a voice said, the time is 8.16 p.m. And I knew it wasn't. It was somewhere in the early 7 o'clock hour. Uh, it was like 7.20 or something like that. So anyway, we get into the hot tub, and, and uh, you know, you can only spend like 20 minutes or 45 minutes, uh, something like that in there, and before too long you get wrinkly and you get sick of it, so you want to get out. And uh, Sarah, my fiance, says, uh, you know, what time do you think it is? And that voice popped into my head again. It said, 8.16 p.m. So I, okay, fine, 8.16 p.m. I, I said it out loud, and, and she's like, how, how are you so sure it's that time? I said, well, I'm not. I just heard a voice in my head say that, you know, the time is 8.16, so I assumed it was talking about this. Like, I had no idea. I fully expected to be incorrect. So she quickly ran in the house and come back just wide-eyed. It was 8.16 p.m. on the dot. So it's just something strange. I don't know why that time popped into my head. And it did so, you know, a good 30 minutes earlier, and I certainly didn't keep track of the time. I had two or three beers while I was in the hot tub, so the last thing I was doing was counting seconds. So... Uh, it was just something weird that happened that uh, I thought kind of correlated with the story a little bit. But as for the actual call, uh, I, I know I've mentioned this before in the past too, but I think it's an important tool, I guess, for people that are concerned about this particular thing, you know, somebody dying in the house that they own. There is a website called diedinhouse.com. It's fairly expensive, but uh, for a one-off, it's it, you know it may be worth it for a little peace of mind. But it will tell you if someone has died in the home that you own or the home that you're looking to, to purchase. So, uh, you know, anyone out there that's kind of curious about that kind of thing, you may want to look into that website. And I'll try to throw a link into the uh, to the show notes as well. But that's uh, diedinhome.com. And in a side note on that, I, I believe, and I'm not a realtor or, or a lawyer by any means, but I believe in most states it is required by law to tell a potential buyer if someone died in the home within the last... I want to say 10 years, something like that. Maybe it's 20 years. But it is uh, their responsibility to share that information with, you know, with a potential buyer. And I did have a friend when I lived in L.A., and, and she lived there as well, but she was looking at an apartment, and her potential landlord, I suppose you would call her, uh, she disclosed the information that a person did take their life in her apartment. And she decided to rent it anyway and apparently had all kinds of experiences. I've yet to get her to call into the show, but... Uh, there was all kinds of strange things that ended up happening in that small uh, West Hollywood apartment. So, you know, if you bought the home and it wasn't disclosed, you, you know, you may want to look into that. Um, you know, somebody may be responsible for that 
yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a complicated and sensitive subject when, you know, somebody potentially dies in a home that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. It's just a strange feeling and a, and a uh, well, obviously, you know, death is, is a big deal for all of us. So uh, anyway, enough of that rambling. Uh, thank you so much for that call. Uh, it's very interesting stuff. Now, before we get to the final call of the evening, I do have a handful of announcements that I need to make. The first is simple. Follow us on social media. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and we have two pages on Facebook. We have the regular group, and then we have the fan page that lets you interact, post, and uh, comment on everything that actually lets you see what's happening. I know the main page pretty much hides everything. Next, we have merch. Uh, I have some t-shirts, I have some koozies, stickers. Well, technically they're decals. I'm working on getting some stickers, I'm working on getting some hats, and I'm hoping to get some winter hats uh, here in the next couple weeks. So that's all stuff that I'm, I'm working on now. I want to remind everyone how to submit their story. Uh, you can call the hotline at 1-888-608-NIGHT. That's 1-888-608-6444. Or you can visit the website at monstersamonguspodcast.com and click on the Report Your Sightings tab. There you can submit anonymously via the Submit Your Sightings tab. And I should say that uh, you can also uh, record your story on your phone and email it to me at uh, Monsters Among Us Podcast at gmail.com. Um, actually, I'm looking for all, any and all stories right now, um, but you guys know I love the monster stories, so if you have one of those, certainly call those in. I am well aware that Halloween is fast approaching, and I typically do some sort of Halloween special, but this year I've just been so <laughs> busy that I simply haven't had time to put anything together. So uh, perhaps if anyone out there has a idea for a show that is not that time consuming, you know, hopefully we can squeeze something together. So shoot me an email or or mention it on Facebook or something. If you have an idea for a Halloween episode that, uh, something that I could put together easily. I also want to mention that our very own Addie Lloyd will be on the Pine Barrens Institute. Now it's not a podcast. It's actually a website, but they do, I guess they're like podcasts. They do little recordings that they release And um, she's going to be featured on that, I believe, later this week. So you might want to look for that next week. But uh, either way, you should definitely check out the Pine Barrens Institute. Adam up there, he puts together quite a website. And if there's anything cryptozoology involved going on, it's certainly going to be featured on that site. Uh, So there'll be a link in the show notes as well. And finally, I have a brand new podcast for you guys to check out. Andrew and Amber put together quite the program. And of course, I'm talking about Into the Portal. Now, each week they take a different paranormal or sometimes historical mystery and they explore it to great lengths. They have quite a dynamic going on and they're very interesting, uh, based out of BC, Canada. So, uh, without further ado, here's their promo. Hello, all you curious creatures out there. I'm Amber A. And I'm Andrew McKay, and welcome into the portal a place where we discuss all things lost, unexplained, and straight up strange. Ancient lost history, cryptozoology, worldwide myths and legends are all things to expect when you dive into the portal. Like the time we covered the strange case of giant humanoid swimmers in Siberia's Lake Baikal, or the terrifying legend of the Braxton County monster who stalked the hills of West Virginia. Oh, and don't forget about the enduring mystery of Egypt's lost underworld. We dig it all, so join us every week for a brand new adventure into some of the world's lesser known unexplained phenomena, cryptic creatures, and historical mysteries. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And of course, at intotheportal.com, your gateway to the bizarre. So come join us. The only question is, will you peer into the portal? I just binged several of their episodes just the other day, and I highly, highly recommend them. Okay, now, as I said, I have one last call to share with you guys this evening. The following is Daniel's call from the state of Indiana. Hey, Derek, this is Daniel. Um, I just wanted to call back in. I think my prior message that I left got cut off and... I had some issues with my phone, um, so I was just going to go ahead and start over. Uh, This is Daniel from southern Indiana, 
and I just wanted to call in and share a little bit of an unsettling encounter that I had. It's really the only strange thing that's ever happened to me, and I just thought it might be interesting to share. And this was several several years back when I was in college. Um, I'm an avid hunter. My family owns some property close to the house, uh, nothing expansive at all, just a few acres, and it is just a few miles from a major highway. Uh, it was November or December, can't remember which, uh, it would have been muzzleloader se- season. Uh, sunrise is around 6.45, 7 a.m., so I probably would have gotten into the woods around 5.30, um, maybe maybe 6, uh, probably more around 5.30. Um, so being muzzleloader season, I decided I'd get up before the sun rose to get a, a good morning hunt in. And I'd gone out the day before and, you know, set up my ground blind at the base of a large tree facing to the east. I drove out to the woods uh, earlier that morning, and it was still, of course, pitch black outside. I slung my muzzleloader over my shoulder, and I picked up my mag light. And I began my uh, my trudge back to my blind. And I sat there. Once I got there, I got settled in. I got my, my muzzle loader ready. Um, probably about maybe 15 to a minutes to a half hour, I began to hear footsteps in the woods coming towards me. And I thought this was a deer, so I was a, a little bit frustrated at first because the sun hadn't yet risen and it's illegal to harvest any game before sunrise. And I don't know what phase the moon was in, but I know it wasn't full because that would have given me plenty of light to see. And it was, um, you know, getting that close to the sunrise, I'm not sure sure what, you know, moon would have really done for me anyway. As the footsteps kind of grew closer, I realized it didn't really sound much like a deer at all. They were heavier and they seemed to drag... Um, a lot more through the leaves than what you would hear uh, the footsteps of a deer or a squirrel or a turkey moving around. And it was at this point I started to hear a really strange huffing noise. Uh, it's really hard even to try to replicate. It, was, it wasn't it was the same or even close to what a, uh, a deer would make. Um, they kind of make a coughing, um, bleeding almost sound or a grunting noise if they're um, startled or if they think they're in danger. This was a lot throatier, um, almost, it was a lot gruffer and a lot throatier. And that kind of set me on edge and freaked me out a little bit. Um, And I feel that was warranted, you know, you sit out in the woods at any time, no matter how long you've been hunting and things like that can freak you out. Um, You know, sitting in the complete darkness, hearing strange noises and, and footfalls, uh, you know, I reached down to fumble in the leaves next to me in the ground and just kind of making some noise, hoping that it would scare off whatever it was. And unfortunately, while wrestling in the, re- the leaves, I also knocked over my mag light, um, and that sent it rolling down the hill out of my reach. And, you know, I thought for sure that this animal or whatever it was would be frightened off by this noise, but it really only it paused for a moment and the footsteps and the huffing noise resumed, moving back in my direction. Uh, It got closer and closer, and eventually um, the noises were so loud that I knew it had to be right in front of me. And, you know, I'll be honest, I thought about just shooting blindly into the darkness in front of me because I was so scared, but since I had a muzzle loader, I'd only have one shot and wouldn't have time to reload. Uh, While all of this was running through my head, I heard that huffing noise again, And I felt something touch my chest, and it actually pushed me back up against the tree. I was still in a sitting position, so it didn't lift me off the ground or anything. But it just pushed me back up against the tree um, to where I was no longer leaning forward. Um, It kind of felt like a balled-up fist right against my sternum. But I suppose it could have been a paw, a snout, or, or anything like that. But whatever it was, it held me there for what felt like forever. But in reality, it was probably more like 10 seconds. Then it sniffed and huffed at me one more time, and it removed whatever it had been pressing up against me, and it continued to walk off behind me at the same slow pace. I waited until I couldn't hear its footsteps any longer, probably another five minutes, stood up, and I booked it back towards my car. 
I didn't bother looking for my flashlight or picking up any of my gear. I just grabbed my muzzle loader and took off as fast as I could. I jumped in my car and I drove home, and I came back uh, later that week in the daytime to pick up my gear. I didn't see any footprints or anything of that nature, and it was a long while before I could go on another morning hunt. And I always now I carry a revolver at my side in addition to whatever long gun I'm taking for the hunt. Now I completely and I fully accept that I could have fallen asleep in the early morning hours and I dreamt all of it, but I just don't believe that's the case. It was far too real and I wasn't tired at all when I went to the woods. And I've had trail cameras on this property for many years and I've caught images of bobcats, coyotes, fox, raccoons, turkey, and as well deer. I suppose it could have been a small bobcat or a coyote, but the footsteps sounded much heavier than that, and those are typically very wary of human activity. I've also entertained the idea that it could have been another human walking through the woods, but that just seems so unlikely, especially if they could do that without a flashlight and walk right to where I was sitting. The property isn't large, just a few acres, and is surrounded by cornfields, cornfields on all sides, so it's not as if it is in the deep woods. It still sticks out in my mind as a very strange experience. I don't know if it could have been another person, wildlife acting uncharacteristically bold, or something else. I really don't know. Again, thanks for the great podcast, and I really appreciate providing a medium through which we can hear these stories. Thank you, Daniel. Now, it must have been awfully dark if you weren't able to see anything in front of you that was actually touching you. So maybe I'm a little confused on that part of the story. Uh, I don't know that I've ever been in the woods at night and found it so dark that I couldn't see if there was something in front of me. But perhaps this particular situation was uh, you were in a highly wooded area or something like that that didn't allow for ambient light to to shine through. Um, or perhaps I'm just confused about the that little detail. But uh, I will say that my initial thought was that it was simply another person, uh, which is something I know that Daniel touched on in his call. But, uh, you know, as, as people find their way into the forest, especially those that aren't familiar, uh, they find themselves on edge. The slightest sound in the, in the distance could launch an imagination into a, a plethora of different uh, creepies and crawlies and, and uh, monsters and beasts that happen to be hiding in the thick woods. But, as Daniel said, he's an experienced woodsman, so I, I highly doubt that he has that same feeling when he enters the woods. I know I grew up, you know, as I've mentioned many times, I grew up in the woods, and I don't have that feeling walking into a forest. Uh, it's usually a more surreal situation. But, uh, you know, it's always, it's always a possibility that simply another hunter was walking through the woods and perhaps maybe pushed on, pushed on Daniel not knowing that he was another person. If it was that dark, maybe... Uh, maybe there's a, another man out there with a similar story that he saw a strange lump against the tree and he poked at it and it never moved kind of situation. But either way, um, this did uh, inspire me to, to do a little research into uh, the Sasquatch phenomenon in the state of Indiana. And I did find a very interesting video. The following audio was recorded by a man named David W. back in 2016 while he was camping in Indiana. Uh, in this particular video is brought to us by Sasquatch Bioacoustic. Uh, take a listen to this. Hi, Menangahila here, and tonight uh, I want to take a look at some audio that I received a few days ago um, from uh, a fella, David W. Uh, David was camping in uh, southern Indiana on October 22nd, and at about 4.50 in the morning, David woke up to hear these vocals in the distance. Uh, he made six audio clips uh, of those vocals over the course of about a half hour and forwarded those to me uh, and asked for my opinion on them. So I wanted to go through these and uh, share some thoughts. You'll notice they all sound fairly similar. They begin with this broadband shriek. 
that narrows down into a tight little kind of a howl ending. There's a If you would like to hear that entire video, you can find the link in the show notes for tonight's episode, and I highly suggest you check it out. I don't know what these sounds are. I know we've touched on some strange sounds in the woods in the past. This one is is no different. It's it's not immediately recognizable to me uh, anyway, and certainly sounds like a primate, to be quite honest. But, uh, you know, the woods are a strange place, and there are people everywhere, so it could be a bunch of kids in a treehouse making howling sounds, for all we know. Uh, so it's, it's always something we need to keep in mind. Either way, I thought it was very interesting, and it does come from the same state that Daniel reported his story from, so I found it very interesting and, and worthy of a few minutes of airtime. So thank you again, Daniel, for taking the time to share that. Now, before I close this episode out, I do want to drop a huge thank you to Beck M, Brad P, Sarah N, Teresa Z, and Sebastian K for their very generous donations to the show. Without donations from these fine people and others like them, the show would not continue. Uh, The bills would just simply pile up. So thank you guys so much for taking the time and opening your pocketbooks to help keep the show going. And before I go, I just want to thank everyone for their patience. Uh, Obviously, I'm not my normal chipper self today, so uh, I realize this show's a bit low energy, but I truly appreciate everyone still tuning in and uh, listening to the content rather than the delivery. So thank you for that. Monsters Among Us is written and produced by me, Derek Hayes. Additional support is provided by Addie Lloyd and Warren Pon Abbott. All audio used in the production of this episode was done so under the protection of fair use. And music for this episode is brought to you by Mayu and Coag Music. Thank you all for listening, and until next week.